garbage. Perhaps the most ubiquitous product of all human endeavors, garbage is a waste that comes back to haunt us. The more advanced our technology becomes, the more garbage we produce. This same axiom is equally valid for computing. On early computers, whose memory was small and expensive, we devoted millions of hours to conserving it. Now, with the inexpensive processors and huge memories, we squander our resources with profligate ease. It is this garbage we shall now explore. To begin with, it is, will be useful to have a clear understanding of how computer memory is organized. In a typical modern computer, the basic unit of memory is a word comprising 32 bits. We'll be limiting our discussion to Lisp con cells, although extensions to other uses of memory are possible and should be deducible by the student. A con cell has a car and a cutter, so we'll be working in, in pairs. The words in a computer are logically ordered as a linear array numbered from zero to the end of memory. For our purposes, we'll just look at six words. The addresses look like this. The numbers stored in each word can be interpreted as representing just about anything. We're working in Lisp, so our numbers will be interpreted as pointers. Take, for example, the first cons box, which is located location zero. Car pointer has the number 0100 in it. That's four in decimal. So we say that it points to location four in memory, which is the address of the third cons box. It could be quite difficult trying to follow binary pointers all over memory, so now that we know how pointers work, we'll go ahead and replace them with lines and arrows, which are much easier to follow. We won't be needing addresses, so we'll get rid of them, too. While we're doing this, we'll also redraw our cons boxes in a more conventional side-by-side -side style. Cars on the right, cutters on the left. Some pointers do not point to other cons cells, but rather to numbers, symbols, nil, etc. These objects we will simply write into the box itself. The actual handling of them is a very interesting topic for another time. Now we can show how to build a typical list. The list 1, 2, 3, for example. Now that we know what memory looks like, let's see how garbage is generated. Suppose you had a variable date which you kept current. Today you would set it to the 30th of January, 87. Tomorrow you would need to change it to the 31st. And voila, the first list is now garbage. The most obvious thing to do is to reclaim storage as soon as it's abandoned. We begin by creating a free list pointer, which links all unused memory together. Here's what free, clean memory looks like. Now we'll repeat our date example. This time, when we recreate our second date, we'll promptly add the now abandoned cells to our free list so that they can be used again. Following the date pointer, we see that it still points to the list 31 January 87. And free points only to unused con cells just the way things should be. This is precisely what is done in many applications and it works quite well. File systems use this technique to keep track of disk blocks, for example. If, however, you wish to be able to share portions of Lisp structure, and we do this regularly in Lisp, we run into a slight problem. Here, instead of creating a completely new list, we're going to cons 31 under the cutter of yesterday's list. If we follow the pointer from date, we can verify that it does indeed point to the proper list, 31 January 87. However, when we put the old boxes back onto the free list, when we go to use date, we find it's a little bit longer than we remember. Two-thirds of our date has been collected back onto the free list. This certainly won't do. We can avoid this little difficulty if we keep track of the number of pointers referencing each cell. By reserving a few bits per cell, we can count the total number of references and refrain from putting cells back onto the free list until their counts go to zero. 
we'll set all the reference counts to zero to start with. Then we'll recreate our date example. Notice that when we set the reference count to the number of pointers pointing to any cell in question, these cells will all get a reference count of one. Now when we cons 31 under the curator of yesterday's date, we decrease the count on the first cell to zero as the date no longer points to it, and when we move the cutter pointer of the new cell to point at the month, we'll increase that reference count to two. Now when we go and return the newly abandoned cells to the free list, we'll only take those with a reference count of zero, which includes the first cell, but when we move this cell's cutter pointer back to the free list, we reduce the number of pointers pointing to the second cell by one, meaning that it is still valid and cannot be collected. Now when we go back to look at the list date, we find that it's correct. This technique is called reference counting, and it too works well in some instances. The Unix file system with multiple references to each file is a good example. There are problems, though. How many bits are we willing to devote to each cell? And what are we going to do if that number is exceeded? Unix allows 256 references to each file. That's 8 bits. If we did the same, we'd use up 11% of our storage, and it still might not be enough. A second problem is that of circular lists. If we build a list foo, and then set the last cutter of that list to point to its head, we change the reference count of the first cell to 2, as both date and the second element of the list point to it. Now, when we delete the last outside pointer pointing to foo by setting foo to nil, we discover that we still have a reference count of 1, because the tail of the list still points to its head, and we can't collect it. There's absolutely nothing we can do short of looking at every cell in memory, and that's what we were hoping to avoid by using reference counting. So once again, reference counting, although useful in restricted instances, is generally not used in LISP systems. We must continue our search for a less expensive, more general method of collecting garbage. One place our search for a better garbage collector might lead us is a typical terminal garden in a typical American university. As we look over a gaggle of typical students hacking on typical programs, we wonder if perhaps a solution to our problems just might walk in through that typical door. the guy. You know, I say to him, uh, why does he take up your leg anyway? Excuse you know? me, gentlemen, but I couldn't help noticing your rather unusual attire. Could you tell our viewing audience who you are and what you're doing here? I'm Mark, and this is my buddy Sweet. We're garbage collectors, and we're the best there are. Yeah, man, trash your memory. Hey, we got the remedy. Uh, yeah. Hey, look, let me give you one of my cards here. Thanks. So you clean up memory. That's what we do. Say you've been out hacking all day and uh, you run out of con space. Are you going to say, tough luck, it happens, lose a day's work? No way. You want that garbage cleaned up so you can save your work. And that's where we come in. That's right. We collect that garbage, put it back on the free list, and you're on your way again. M Mr. Mark, would you mind comparing your services to those of your competitions, specifically those of reference counters? Competition? You call that? Competition? Listen, we do our work with a maximum of one bit per console, maybe 2% of your memory at most. ORC needs five, ten times that, and he still won't guarantee that you won't overflow on reference counts. And he can't do circular lists either. No. That's right. We do circular lists without even thinking about it. Besides that, old RC is there looking over your shoulder every cons, every assignment, always bogging you down. He can take up 20% of your CPU right there. Yeah, us, we lay back, let you do your work in peace, zero overhead. Then when you need us, we come in and do our stuff. You go out, take a coffee break, you probably even need one by then. When you come back, you got a clean machine raring to go. That certainly does sound impressive. Your clients must be very pleased with your work. 
And now, let's go back to the studio and see how it is the Mark and Sweep garbage collector really works. The Shore Weight Garbage Collection Algorithm is a principal algorithm used in most list systems since its invention in 1966. This stop and collect algorithm comprises two main phases, the mark phase and the sweep phase. We shall now illustrate them. Once again, we will deal with only one valid variable, date, although the extension to a system dealing with many variables should be apparent. We will now build up some simple structures using date. Today's date, followed by tomorrow's date. We'll add February 1st and Groundhog's Day. Finally, we'll con the date onto itself so that we can illustrate what happens with shared list structure. We've now used up all eight of our con cells and we need to reclaim the unused ones. First, let's see what date looks like and we see that date is the list of 2 February 87 and 2 February 87. Now let's collect all the garbage. This is how we do it. First, we follow date's pointer to the first cons box and we mark it. For marking, we require one bit per cell, so we'll redraw our entire extra box and mark it for this con cell. Now we follow the car pointer to the next box and mark whatever it points to. Next, we repeat our marking sequence recursively, starting with the second box. We follow the car pointer, but discover the car is a number. We can't collect numbers, so we'll leave this one alone and follow the cutter pointer instead. Here we repeat the marking sequence recursively, starting with the present box. The car is a number, so we can't collect it and we'll just leave it alone and follow the cutter pointer instead, marking whatever it points to. Next, we repeat the marking sequence recursively, starting with this box. The car pointer is a number, so we follow the cutter pointer instead. This cutter is nil, so we're entirely done with this cell. We'll pop back up to the previous cell. This box we've already followed both pointers from, so we'll pop back up to the previous cell again. This box we've already followed both pointers from, so we'll pop back up to the previous cell. This box we've only po followed the car pointer from, so let's follow the cutter now. But we notice that that box has already been marked. So we say we're done and pop back up to where we came from, which just happens to be date, the original pointer, and the marking phase is over. The sweep phase consists of running a pointer through memory, top to bottom, and adding all the unmarked cells to the free list. The first cell is unmarked, so it goes on to the free list. The second cell is also unmarked, so it goes on to the free list too. The third cell is marked, so we don't disturb it. The fourth cell we collect. The fifth cell we also collect. The rest of the cells are all marked, so we'll leave them alone. Now let's go back and check to see if everything looks correct. Let's see what's on the free list. The free list is correct, so let's go back and look at date. And we see that the list date is still the list 2 February 87, 2 February 87. One more thing should be noticed before leaving this most classic of algorithms. This is compaction. On many virtual memory computers, it is very nice to have all active con cells close to one another. To make this happen, we do the same thing that we did before in the mark phase, only we'll skip sweep phase. Now, we start two pointers, one from either end of memory. We move the top one down until we find a good cell. And we move the bottom one up until we find an empty one. We copy the good cell into the bad cell. Then we put a forwarding pointer into the old cell. We continue moving the pointers 
until they come together. All good data is now compacted to the bottom of memory. There is, however, one pointer still pointing to the forwarded cell. We'd best fix this before resuming list processing. This time, all we have to do is look at the car and cutter in the good half of memory to see if they point beyond the good half of memory. None of these cells do, so they're okay. This cell does, so we'll copy the forwarding pointer into this cell and look at the rest. Now we're done. Because all garbage is collected together in one half of memory, we don't even have to make up an explicit free list, but we can allocate cells by moving the free pointer up. With the development of the mark and sweep garbage collector, it would seem that our problems are over. Requiring a known minimum of overhead in both time and space, we're guaranteed of collecting all unused con cells, no matter what they might be pointing at. As we observe a panorama of contented hackers typing enthusiastically away, we can relax in the confidence of having a dependable, robust garbage collector, which will keep our world tidy and safe. Clearly all major concerns about garbage are alleviated and there's nothing left for us to worry about. Or is there? Oh no! No! This can't be! Not now! I've got a big show to go to tonight! No! What's wrong? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do? No! No! There's nothing anybody can do now! It's too late! Why? What is it? It's... It's garbage collecting. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, the sad truth of the matter is the very power of the mark and sweep garbage collector is its greatest weakness. It's a stop and collect algorithm, and that means it has to stop, possibly for a very long time. Excuse me, sir, but have you ever had garbage collector problems? Have I had garbage collector problems? Why, I used to be the scanner operator on the USS Enterprise. Yes? One time we'd encountered some Klingons and engaged them in battle. We'd just gotten a phaser lock on their ship when... When... Oh. I'm very sorry for you. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, have you ever had garbage collector problems? What? what? Oh, garbage? Garbage collector? Yes, garbage collector. That's what I'm doing. I'm garbage collecting. Over 10 gigabytes in this database. President Nixon is waiting for the results of this database. Yes, well, a stop and collect algorithm has its uses. Sometimes we simply can't afford to wait. Sometimes we'd gladly give up both speed and space if only we knew we would never come to a complete halt. Sometimes we would give up our, our right pointer for a real-time dynamic garbage collector. The dynamic garbage collector was invented in 1973 by Henry Baker of MIT. It works like this. Initially, all con space is divided into two halves, new space and old. All consing will be done in new space until it is filled. This time we'll use a slightly simpler set of lists. New space is now filled. At this point a couple of things happen. The two spaces are flipped. New becomes old and old becomes new. All future consing will be done in the new, new space. At the same time the first cell that date points to is copied over into new space. The old cell has its car pointer changed to point to its new location, and it is marked as forwarded. From now on, any references to this cell will be forwarded to its new location. Now we resume normal processing. When we next call cons, two things happen. First, we allocate the new cons box normally. Second, we create a special pointer in the new new space and set it to the first cons box. We follow the pointers of the first cell. The car is a number, so 
we'll follow the cutter instead. This cutter points into old space, so we'll copy the cell that it points to into new space and leave behind a forwarding pointer in case another pointer R also points there. We'll also change the cutter pointer we were working with to point to the copy in new space. We'll repeat this process for a second cell. Our objective here is to catch up with the free list pointer, so we need to move up two cells for every one we cons. The car is a number, and following the cutter for the second con cell, we discover that it has already been forwarded. We follow the forwarded pointer and copy that into our cutter. Having spent a finite amount of time garbage collecting, we now resume normal list processing. The next time we call cons, we'll repeat the process. We perform the cons operation normally and follow the pointers from two cells. From now on, with each new consing operation, we will do a small amount of garbage collection following two cars and two cutters. If the pointer we follow already points into new space, there's nothing to do. If it points back to a forwarded cell, we just update the pointer in new space. Otherwise, we copy the cell from old space to new. As we work, notice that as we move the pointer copied through the memory, we are guaranteed that every pointer behind it points into new space. So when it catches up with the start of free space, we're done. There will be no valid data left in old space. The copied pointer has now caught up with the free list pointer and there is no valid data left in old space. We can continue to cons in the new space until it fills up and when that happens we can safely fill up the spaces again and continue consing ad infinitum. We have looked at simplified versions of the three major methods of dealing with garbage, reference counting, the mark and sweep garbage collector, and the dynamic garbage collector. Although all that we have seen is correct, it is far from the complete picture. We have left out a few complications, such as how you keep track of where you came from during the recursive marking phase. We've ignored numerous other interesting methods of collection, such as the ephemeral garbage collector, which is a hybridization of reference counting and the shore weight collector, and various other schemes for parallel processors. We have also completely ignored the time costs of running these collectors. So there is much left to be learned. We can't be sure of much in this world, but this is certain. As long as there are computers, there'll be garbage 